Come on, give God praise, everybody. Only God can do that. Well, happy Resurrection Sunday, everybody. He is risen. He is risen. And they used to say, he is risen indeed, right? All right, you may grab a seat. Good to have you here. Welcome. My name is Darren, for those of you who are new. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so delighted that you've come today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you came to church today. Now turn to the other side and say, I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> and all of you joining us online, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, before I jump into it, I want to direct your attention. There's a little connection card. Uh, it's in your seat in front of you. Everybody grab one of those or pull it out of the worship guide. And I just want to do the little annual Easter survey that I do every Easter because that's the Sunday all of you all show up on the same Sunday. And so uh, you'll notice on the bottom there's a little prayer request portion. And if you have a, a need for prayer for anything, I encourage you to fill that out. And uh, you can mark it confidential if you want or you can let our prayer team pray for it. And then come Saturday at our prayer meeting your need will be prayed for hundreds of times by people. And that's just an amazing thing to think that God could um, hear the, your specific need and have people pray over what's going on in your life. And then on the back side, you'll see the little Easter survey. You'll, say, you'll see, I'd like to hear what the Bible has to say, and then there's a list of themes. And I would love to know what's on your mind, what's on your heart, and then as I prepare for the fall, I will come back and listen to what you say and uh, bring you messages from God's Word uh, related to the themes that you select. So go ahead and fill that out. Keep that on your uh, lap. Just keep it close, and then we'll come back to this card at the end of the message. There's also some uh, message notes on the inside of this worship guide if you'd like to follow along. But today is Resurrection Sunday, and so I want to talk to you today from the resurrection chapter of the Bible. It's the most significant chapter that explains the resurrection, and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You guys ready? You ready to go? All right. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. It says, now if Christ is preached, if Christ is preached that he is risen from the dead, then how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead. I want to talk to you today about a real resurrection. Somebody say a real resurrection. It's real. It's real. So let's pray. Now, God, I humble myself before you. I'm so privileged to stand here today. And Lord, today I know that we're not here by accident. Every married couple, every single person, every young man, young woman, every person watching online, we're all connected, we're here by your providence. And so Lord, we open our hearts to you, we hold nothing back. I pray that you would help and you would heal and you would transform today in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna tell you a story. Uh, when I was a young pastor in, in my, the first church that I served, different church, uh, I would often pray for a woman that would come forward for prayer she was an older woman, she was a widow, she had no family, no children, no friends, but she would come and she would ask for prayer. She was very poor, and I can remember many times helping her. We, the church would respond and pay for groceries or pay for a bill, a utility bill, or pay for heat in her home, or at certain times even financially assist uh, in the paying of the mortgage of her little home. And I remember one day we got a call from the hospital, poor Regina had died. And no one had come to claim the body, but they had found a church bulletin from our church in her purse, and so they called the church. So we came and we identified her and signed the death certificate and uh, paid for her little funeral, just a, just a few of us that were there. And then the state uh, declared that the church would be the executor of her estate since no one else uh, came to do it. So I, kinda, I can remember we went to her little shack of a home and it was something straight out of hoarders. It was, you walked in the door and there were just piles of stuff, junk everywhere, like a little trail going through the living room and the smell of decay and the piles of 
moth-eaten clothing and all kinds of papers, papers, papers everywhere, stacks of papers. And inside those papers were stock certificates, thousands of them. There were certificates for safety deposit boxes that contained precious metals and rubies and diamonds. There were certificates of bonds. There was so much wealth in all of those stacks of paper that her estate ended up coming in the end to over a million dollars. Poor Regina was not poor. No windfall for me, no windfall for the church though, because in those stacks of papers there was also a will that said that it all went to some TV evangelist. Can you imagine? <laughs> there is some TV evangelist in America somewhere praising God for his miracle. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Thank, you know, praising God, but you know, you're welcome. I say I tell you that story because poor Regina was not poor. Poor Regina had everything, but she didn't believe that she had everything. In other words, she had, all, she had all this wealth, she had all of this, she had everything that she needed, but somehow she didn't believe in what she had. She had a scarcity mentality. She had everything, but she did not have what she thought she needed. And I wanna talk about that today because this is what this chapter in the Bible is all about. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people in a city called Corinth, and in Corinth, they had a lot of problems. In the, in the church, they had a lot of problems. They had a lot of relational issues. And just like Regina, whose life was jacked up and everything around her was crumbling, Paul is saying that, that your lives have a lot of problems and everything in your life, all, all these problems he's addressing chapter after chapter, he comes to the 15th chapter and he says, there's really just one reason why you have all these other problems. And it's unbelief. The reason why you have your life is jacked up, the reason why your relationships are crumbling, the reason why there's all these issues, at the end of the day, there's just one reason why your life is jacked up and everything around you is crumbling. And he begins to describe in this chapter 15 the essential heart of the gospel. You ever heard that word gospel before? It means good news. And, and if you ever wanted to know what is the gospel, this chapter explains it because Paul is coming back to the very basics and he says, listen, the reason why your life is crumbling and your relationships are jacked up is because you've missed, you haven't understood the clear, simple, essential idea of the gospel. And so in the very first verses of this chapter, he begins to explain the gospel. If nobody's ever explained it before, you're gonna hear it today. It's so simple. In fact, in this chapter, he outlines three essential components of the gospel. And so in the third verse of the 15th chapter, Paul says, what I received, I pass on to you. That, that, that this is the most important idea, so this is the gospel. This is the good news, that Christ died for our sins. That's the first component. Everybody say that. Christ died for our sins. That means that Christ took upon himself the punishment that you and I should have deserved. Like it should have been me and it should have been you hanging up there on that cross. But how many of you are glad today it's good news that Christ died for our sins? I should have died. You all know that you all should have had some punishment for the stuff that you've done in your life with your jacked up, nasty self. You know that you have done some things. Don't be looking at me like you don't know. Like every one of, don't be looking at me like you haven't done something wrong. You have done wrong things in your life. The Bible says all have sinned, all of us have fallen short, but yet on him God laid the sins of us all. So the first component of the gospel is that I didn't have to die for my sins. I didn't have to take the punishment. Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. But not only that, he was buried. He died for our sins and he was buried. And that's significant. It's the second component of the gospel that when Jesus took all of our sins upon him, and then he was buried, that, that represents the idea that God took all of our sins, placed it on Jesus, and Jesus was buried, and with Jesus, all of our sins were buried too. And that's good news, everybody, because God does not keep bringing up your sins over and over again. When they're paid for, they are buried and they are forgotten. He doesn't keep bringing them back up. I know people will keep bringing up the sins of your past to you and tell you what you used to be, but thank God, everybody, God does not keep bringing up your sins. He doesn't bring up your path. Anybody glad that there's things in your life that aren't going to get brought up again? How many of you are glad that there's some things that will just stay back there? 
But he did that. He not, only, he not only died for our sins, our sins were buried with Christ. But then there's a third part of the gospel, a third component, and that really ties it all together and makes it work, and that is he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. He rose again. Now, I believe that there's many of you who got up this morning and came to church because you believe that. There might be some of you who question that. But I have to say that that is the essential of the gospel. I want to spend my time here on that today because he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and his resurrection is real. And the problem is there's a lot of us who say that he rose from the dead, but we are like Regina living in that house with, a, with wealth all around us, but we don't even know what we have. We, we live a life of a, with a scarcity mentality. We're living with some, some, some idea of what we have, but we don't understand the power of what we have. I want to tell you today that the resurrection, the resurrection is real. But some of y'all are acting like you know it as a fact, but, you, but your life does not communicate in any way that the resurrection is real. And if the resurrection isn't real, then everything about your faith will crumble and your lives will be jacked up. What are you saying, Pastor? What are you saying? Well, let me just slow this down. Can I slow it down? <laughs> I'm not going too fast. Can I slow it down? If you say that the resurrection is real, does your life reflect that? It ought to reflect that. There ought to be something, if you say the resurrection is real, it ought to affect the way that you talk in your speech. It ought to affect your attitude. It ought to affect the relationships that you have. It ought to reflect in your decisions. It ought to reflect in your sense of peace and security. It ought to reflect in the way that you look at the world and how you spend your money. Uh, why is it so quiet in here like you all don't know? If the resurrection is real, it ought to affect something. You ought to be living life with some sense of victory, some sense of purpose, some sense of, some sense of, you know what? It doesn't matter what it looks like because even if stuff dies, my God can bring dead things back to life. There is nothing too hard for my God. There's nothing impossible. So I don't, I'm not afraid. I don't live in anxiety. I don't live my life wringing my hands. I don't live my life worried because Jesus rose from the dead. That means that he is in charge. That means he's all powerful. And that means he cares about me, yes. and there's nothing that I need to worry about or be afraid. Is there anything in your life that reflects that you believe that the resurrection is real? And I want to talk about that today, because a lot of us say we believe Jesus rose from the dead. But I want to clear this up. I want to make it plain. I want to make it clear. Say make it clear. Make it clear. That's what I'm trying to do. Jesus said this about himself. You have to think this through. Make, let, me, let me make this really clear. Jesus said, I am the, and the Father are one. We're the same. He said to another, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And people looked at him like, are you for real? He said, yeah, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I and the Father are one. And then he said, they will take me, and they will arrest me, and they will kill me, but on the third day, I will rise again. Jesus said that. Y'all know he said that? Jesus actually said that they will kill me, but the, but the Son of Man, I will rise again on the third day. Now, y'all have to deal with that. You have to decide what you believe about that. C.S. Lewis said that everybody has to understand and wrestle with the claims that Jesus made about himself that he claimed to be God, and that is either true or false. It's either false or it's true. You gotta decide which one that it is. And if it's false, then you gotta wrestle with one of two options. If it's false, that means Jesus either knew his claim was false, and that makes him the greatest liar who ever lived. Think about that, that he would know, that he would know he was, he was not the son of God, but he told everybody his whole life. That would make him the greatest liar in all of history. Or he didn't know that his claim was false, so he's going around telling everybody that he's God, but he's not. That would make Jesus one of the greatest crazy people, lunatics of all time. So if it's false, he's either a liar or he's a lunatic, and C.S. Lewis would say, but if it's true, then Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the king, and then he's God. He's king of kings, and he is Lord of lords. And so I choose... 
I have made a choice to embrace with everything that's within me to believe and to embrace and to accept that Jesus is the Lord. Nobody made me do it. Nobody backed me up to it. I just believe, I choose to believe that he's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He is the Lord. He is who he said he was. So what do you choose? What will you choose to say? You can't just say, well, he was a good guy and I follow his teachings. No, you have to decide, was he, was he a liar? Is he, is, is he a lunatic or is he the Lord? And so that's what Paul's after here. He's trying to say, he's trying to clarify for believers. They're in church, but he's trying to say, hey, hey, the reason why you have so many problems in your life, all the issues in your life, the drama in your life, the reason why your relationships are jacked up and your life is crumbling around you is because he would say, come on now, like, like, if he's been raised from the dead, if Christ has been preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some of you still say that there is no resurrection? Some of you would say, well, I believe in the resurrection, but is there anything in, in your life that indicates that you actually believe? I want you to wrestle with these implications. What does it mean if Jesus actually was raised from the dead? What if his resurrection was real? What would that change about the way you think? How would that affect your decisions? How would that affect the way you see the world and how you relate with people if the resurrection was real? And it was real, and the Apostle Paul goes into this chapter to explain the resurrection was real. It was real. Real means it was valid. It was, it was not imagined. It was sure. It was, it was a, it's a secure idea. And he goes through this chapter and he gives us actually three reasons why the resurrection is real. And I'm just going to pull them and lift them out of this chapter where he laid it out so clearly some reasons why the resurrection is real. You can write them down if you want to. The first one is there, there were witnesses to the resurrection. He talks about eyewitnesses, known named real individuals that, that saw Jesus die and then saw him raised from the dead. And so he talks about how Peter was one of those people. Peter saw him killed with his own eyes, and then he saw him afterwards raised from the dead, saw the nail prints in his hands, the, and he saw the, 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 the wound in his side. He saw him alive afterwards, not only Peter, but all the 12. The, the 12 disciples, they saw Jesus die, and then they saw him alive. After that, he goes on to say, Paul says, there, are, there were at one time more than 500 brothers and sisters who saw him at the same time. That's incredible. So, so, so Peter, and then the 12, and then at another time, even 500, and they're still alive today at the time of this writing. He said, you can ask them for, them, for yourself. They're real people. Now, some of you all will say, well, that was written a long time ago, and how do we know that that's true, and how do we know that Peter wasn't drunk? I mean, he was, maybe he was high. Maybe he hallucinated. And maybe the 12, okay, maybe they, they hallucinated. Maybe they were drunk. So someone will say, well, Peter was drunk and the 12 were drunk. But there's no way you can make me believe that there were 500 people that were all drunk at the same time, at the same party. I don't know any party that you went to where all 500 people were drunk at the same party. I didn't go to that party. Maybe you all have gone to a party like that, but I have not gone. I don't know anybody. There's, there's no way that 500 people hallucinated. So you see Paul's building a case here. He's, he's laying out that there were, there were known named individual people that actually saw Jesus dead and then saw him, literally the Greek said, a corpse standing up walking. They saw him resurrected. And then he goes on to say that, <laughs> that James, the apostle, so, so not James, one of the 12. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now how many of you know that the last person you want to be God is your stepbrother? And he didn't believe. He was a skeptic. It goes, the Bible's very clear that James did not believe. He was one of the family that came. It says, to take charge of Jesus, they thought he was out of his mind. They thought he was a lunatic. And they were going to bring him home. Stop talking. But James saw his brother, his half-brother, killed, and then he was raised from the dead. And so James was a believer. And then he goes on to say all the apostles. In fact, all the apostles bore witness to their deaths. Every one of them martyred. Every one of them killed, saying, you can kill my body, but I will never stop saying that I saw Jesus raised from the dead. That's incredible. And then I love what Paul said at the very end. He says, last of all, least of all, me. Like one who was born out of the sequence of all the others, I saw him too. I saw him. I'm an eyewitness. 
That's pretty, that's pretty compelling testimony in any court that you would ever find real individual people. And Paul saying, I, I saw him too. Now, some of you would say, well, that was written a long time ago. And how do we know that that can be trusted? How can we know that that's true at all? Well, let me bear witness to this myself, that like Paul, I too have seen him. I've seen him for myself. Ask can anybody who knows him personally that's here today, can I get a witness that anybody would say, well, I've seen him. I've known him. I've seen him answer prayer. I've seen him work miracles. I've seen him come through and provide in ways that I never could understand, send money that I didn't know was coming on the way. I've seen God provide answers for miracles. I've seen God come in my darkest hour and touch me and whisper into my heart and give me a peace that passes all understanding. When I was in trouble, when I was messed up, when I was insecure and afraid, and there God came in the middle of my darkest hour. I can tell you I have seen him for myself. Have you seen him for yourself? Was there anybody, are there any modern day witnesses who would say, well, I, I've seen him too. So there are witnesses to the resurrection. And then Paul shifts gears and he kind of gives the opposite. He says, he talks about the worthlessness of life if the resurrection wasn't real. So there's witnesses to his resurrection. It's compelling, but then he makes the argument about how worthless, how futile, how empty, how useless life would be if the resurrection wasn't real. Watch what he says. If Christ has not been raised, watch this. He, first thing he says, our preaching is useless. Stop right there. He's saying that if the resurrection wasn't real, then my preaching, Paul says, is useless. Now, I relate to this. I have been preaching the gospel for like probably 30 years now. And if the resurrection isn't real, that means that everything that I have said in the last 30 years has been worthless. That is unbelievable. That is a crazy thought to think that everything that all my preaching would be useless. In fact, if Jesus did not get up out of the grave, what am I doing here right now? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? I could be out scuba diving or something else. I could be playing golf I, if, my preaching wasn't, if my preaching was useless. But let me tell you something. I'm compelled to be here because my preaching is not useless. I'll tell you this. The preaching of may be foolishness to some, but to those who believe it is the power of God unto salvation that I have seen the preaching of the gospel change people's lives. I've seen the preaching of the gospel pull people out of their addictions, out of their problems, out of their darkness, out of their depression, that the word of God is alive and living and powerful, and it just opens up and brings people into life, and so somehow I know this gospel changes lives. I don't understand it, but I understand that the gospel, when preached, has power. Faith comes by the hearing of the word. I just don't understand how that works, but it happens. So, but he says, but if, if, if Christ hasn't been raised, then that would all be worthless. And then he goes on to say that your faith would be worthless. Can you imagine that everything that, that you say you believe would be worthless? And yet I know that it is my faith that has got me through some of my darkest hours. That it was faith that held me when I felt like everything was falling apart. It was my faith. It was the trust. It was the deep-rooted belief aided by the Spirit of God within me that helped me to hang on in my darkest days. Faith got me through. But if the resurrection wasn't real and there was no Holy Spirit inside of me, then my faith, it would just be empty memories. How many of you know Jesus is not just a memory? He is alive. He is real. I, I, believe, I believe he's on the inside of me even now. I can feel his presence as I speak to you in this moment. But then he goes on to say that if Jesus wasn't raised, then watch this, we would be found to be false witnesses. <laughs> he says that if Jesus wasn't raised and we told people that he was raised from the dead, then we'd actually just be liars. <laughs> now, I got a lot of problems in my life. I, I know I do. I know that I'm not perfect, but I can tell you that being a liar is not one of them. And that people who have said over the years, I know he's alive. I can feel his presence in me. I, I believe I, they're not liars. And there are millions of people today who are declaring Jesus Christ arose from the dead, and they're not all liars. But if we weren't 
If, if he wasn't raised, we'd all be liars, he says, because we testified about Christ being raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, here's the most amazing thing he says. He says that not only would our, would our, our faith be futile, but that we would still be in our sins. And I know he's alive. I know he is risen from the dead because I'm not still bound up in my sin. I, there's been a change. I'm not the same person that I used to be. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say I may not be everywhere that I want to be. I may not be all that I want to be, but I can surely thank God that I am not where I used to be. Can I get a witness from anybody who would say, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. I used to be, you know, you used to be in trouble. You used to be afraid. You used to be a prisoner to fear and to hate. You used to be scared. You used to be a prisoner to anger and to lust and to lying and you, to, to every relationship that, that you got involved with. It always got wrecked up. You used to be that way, but thank God, look at you now. Look where he's brought you from. Look how he's lifted you up. Look at how he's changed your life. Can some of you all even remember what it was like before? Yes. Can you remember? Can you remember what it was like back then? You remember, you remember, you remember? <laughs> when, when, when certain people came around and you just couldn't say no? When certain places you went and suddenly you were all caught back up in it again, certain smells, certain streets, certain places, and you just couldn't walk away? <laughs> oh, but look at you now. Look where you are today. Look where God has brought you to. Look where he's brought you from. Look what he's done in your life. I can know that I can find some modern-day witnesses that would testify and say, thank God, I'm not where I used to be. I'm not trying to claim to be perfect. I'm not trying to claim that I've got it all together. I'm not trying to say that I dot every T and uh, uh, dot every T, cross every T, see, and dot every I. I can't even say it correctly, but I'm so thankful that I'm not, I don't have to be perfect, but I thank God that he's taken me a mighty, mighty long way. I'm not... He's moved me. He's changed me. He's delivered me. He's, he's transformed me. And he's got more to do. But, he, but, but the great thing about walking with God, it's not just that he, he's not just a fact of history, but there is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is transforming my life today. That's a, that same power is changing me. And he's doing that for every person who believes. That's what's incredible about it. I'm taking too long in this point, but I love the way that it feels right now. That, that God doesn't just leave us where, we've, where we are. We don't just have some facts, some theology to believe, but there's power that he doesn't leave us in our sins. It's amazing that over time in your life, how when you walk with God, God just reveals to you more and more of himself and you see life differently and you become changed. Like he'll actually set you free from your yesterdays. He awakens and gives you purpose that you didn't know was possible. He leads you to make a difference from your life and you look back on yourself and you say, I don't even recognize who that person was. I wish I had four or five of you who would just say, yes, I know what you're talking about. But if Christ has not been raised, then I would just still be in my sins. I'd be the same old person. One of the reasons I know he's alive is that I'm not still in my sins. But then he would say, uh, if, if he wasn't raised, all those who have fallen asleep in Christ would be lost. And that's a, that's a tragic thought. Can you imagine that every person who died believing in Christ, their life would have been wasted? that their life would be lost. They would have perished forever. <laughs> but we believe that to be absent with this body is to be present with the Lord. That's the amazing thing. That's called the blessed hope. It's the idea and the peace that comes. People who know that the resurrection is real, they have this sense to know that I'm not, I'm not losing my mind. You should have lost your mind, but you're not losing your mind. You're not going on the floor crazy. You're not freaking out and crying because you know this is just the house this body occupied. They're not really gone. I'm just, this is not goodbye. This is see you later. They transition one breath in this moment, the next breath in the presence of Jesus. And I've seen a lot of funerals in my day. I've seen a lot of things. I've seen people lose their minds. I've seen people cry, jump on the casket. I've seen it, I've seen it all, a little bit of everything. And then I've seen people who grieve, not like those who have no hope. It is a different thing. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? That it's sad, it's tragic, there's loss, but I don't grieve like those who have no hope. Like we're not flipping out, baby, because grandpa's gone. We just, we just know that his house is just here. He's already gone to his eternal destination. He is with the Lord. But if he wasn't raised, it would be useless. And he goes on to say, and if it was all, if he wasn't raised from the dead, and if it was all only for this life, uh, we who hope in Christ, we would be people who would be most pitiful <laughs> to be pitied. In other words, what, he, what he's saying is that if there was only, if all there was was this life, like that's it, and it all just ends here at the end, how pitiful that would be. Come on now. It's, some of you all think, well, my life is good, but every year it keeps going, Right? The older you get and the longer you live and the heavier things get. And the, I'm so glad I'm not just living only for this body that I'm in right now. I'm glad that one day I get a new body, the Bible says. I don't have to be concerned with weight loss my whole life in the future. I'm so glad that I don't have to be dieting for the rest of my eternity. I'm glad that I'm going to get a new body. I'm glad that I'm going to get a new body. I'm glad that my hair is not going to fall out for all of eternity. I'm glad that my eyes will work and I can see again. That's going to be an amazing thing. Some of you all think I'm up here with no notes. It's because I can't see anything anymore. <laughs> so that's all that it is. Thank God that one day I'm going to get new eyes. Thank God one day I don't have to worry about cancer anymore. Thank God I don't have to worry about COVID one day. Thank God that I don't have to worry about any condition, anything, any sickness, disease, diabetes, heart disease, blood pressure, everything. All of that will be gone. He'll wipe away every tear from my eye. There's a better, we, we, look, we know that we have power to change today, but we look forward to a better future. Yes. That it's not just this life, that, that what Jesus did on that cross and that fact that he rose again from the dead. See, that's what sets Jesus apart, everybody. Lots of people died. Lots of people got crucified and were buried, but there's only one person that got up out of the grave. There's only one person that conquered death eternally. And that's really the wonder of his resurrection. In fact, Paul finishes out the chapter and he just breaks out into awe. He goes, there's something so wonderful about the idea of the resurrection, which is why I know many of you believe it, but when was the last time you stopped to just be in wonder of the resurrection? See, some of you who are believers in Jesus, you understand these facts and you believe in church that he's raised from the dead, but you'll go out of here Monday and you'll wring your hands and you'll worry and you'll fret about who's in the government and you'll get all anxious about politics and you'll freak out about every other thing going on as if, as if God is not in control of everything. And yet he is a God who raises dead things up. You should not worry about one thing. This is, he, he, he finishes up this chapter saying there's something awesome about the idea of a resurrection, that, that if he really was raised from the dead, that ought to change everything. It should be wonderful. You say, what's wonderful, Pastor? I'll tell you. Watch this. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of many. Notice this. Jesus didn't just rise from the dead. He, he makes it plain to say Jesus was the first of many who are going to rise from the dead. Oh, that's good news, everybody. That means it's not just about Jesus. That means that his resurrection is actually your resurrection too. That one day that it's not just about him being raised, but that all of y'all who believe and who trust in Jesus are going to be raised from the dead. That means that, that Jesus' resurrection, he conquered death eternally that you don't have to live with the fear of dying anymore, that you don't have to live with this dread. Can you imagine what, how that ought to change in this country, in this world today, with people afraid of what's gonna happen down at the mall next time I go? And you're just walking around like, I ain't worried about nothing because Jesus conquered the grave. <laughs> to, to live is Christ, to die is gain, I'll have heaven on the other side. I am not worried because I believe in the resurrection. This life is not all that there is. When was the last time you contemplated the power of the resurrection? He says that, that, that he is the first of many who have fallen asleep. And then he says this. He says, yep, the end will come. The fact is, Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead, and he said, I will return. I am coming again, and when he comes back, he will set everything right, which means that every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, ultimately, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It says here that when he, when he comes, he'll hand over the whole world, the kingdom of this world, to, the, to his Father, 
after he puts an end to all rulers and authority and power, which means he will be over it all. There's nothing, there's no power, there's no policy, there's nothing going on in this world today that Jesus won't come back and set right. Why are y'all freaking out and acting like there's no hope? Why are you acting like there's no God in heaven who cares? Jesus is over it all, he's coming again. And watch this, it's not like he just might do it, it says he must reign, he will reign, he has to reign, he is the king of kings, he is the lord of lords, and everything will be under his feet, everything will be under his control. He's put it all under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed ultimately is death itself. Death itself, Jesus says that the last enemy, Christ conquered the grave, that's why he would go on to say, he laughs, he goes, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Some of you have been living your life afraid of death scared about that moment, scared about that final end. And listen, Paul says the grave's been robbed of its victory. The grave doesn't have victory. There's no sting in death anymore. You can be sad, you can grieve, but you can grieve with some perspective, everybody, that we don't grieve with those like those who have no hope. We grieve knowing that one day we'll see our loved ones again. One day we will rise from the dead ourselves. I can live my life and never have to be afraid of dying. That is the good news. That is the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead and it was verified by some witnesses, a whole lot of them. There was Peter. There was the 12, there was 500 at one time. There was James the apostle and there was all the apostles and then there was Paul himself and then there is Darren and he said, <laughs> there is, he is alive because I've seen him for myself as can every one of you who have seen him. And then my preaching's not in vain and my life is not in vain, my faith's not futile. My, my, it's not been a lie that we've witnessed about the resurrection of Jesus. We know that our sins have been washed away and that we are changed. We know that he is alive, that he has raised something inside of us from the dead. We know that we are walking in victory. We know that he's coming again. We know that death has been conquered and the grave has been, has been robbed of its victory. Oh, come on, somebody give God praise if you believe that the resurrection is real. It's real. And the same power, this is what I want to close on today, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to every single person who's listening to me today. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I can tell you this, he changes lives. He transforms lives. He sets people free. And some of you will say, well, I've never seen him for myself. That's true, because a lot of people have never seen God. They've seen church, and they've seen religious people, and they've seen hypocrites, and they've stayed a long way back. But the scripture says, if you will come close to God, God will come close to you. What's amazing about that is, if you come close to God, if you draw near, what, what happens is God will come close and God will reveal himself to you. Because some of y'all, you don't need an encounter with the church. You need an encounter with a real God. You need an encounter, you need to know God. Not just know about God, you need to know him personally. And once he opens your eyes, once he opens the eyes of your heart and you can see him for yourself, you will never be the same. And he will forgive all of your sin. He will restore and heal the broken parts of your life. And he will take you by the hand and he will lead you to freedom. He'll lead you to the purpose for which you originally were created. The Bible calls Jesus the redeemer. That means that he redeems mistakes and he redeems problems. And he takes what was a mess in our lives and God says, I'll work it all for good into my plan. And he'll cause you to make a difference and bring you fulfillment and he'll give you a home in heaven to boot. That's my king, he's alive, he's raised from the dead. I'm telling you the resurrection is real. Do you guys receive this today? Amen. I wanna close a little differently. I wanna bring you back to that little card that I talked to you about in the beginning. If you'd pull out that card one more time. I want to lead you to a clear, a clear recognition. I want to bring you back to that choice. What do you believe about Jesus? Is he a liar? Was he crazy? Is he a lunatic? Or is he the Lord? There are four little letters right across the front of this card, A, B, C, or D. And I wanna ask every person, you're one, of, you're one of these, whether you fill out the card or not, you are one of these four letters. Everybody here, anybody watching online. There's an electronic version of this card if you wanna click the button and pull this up on your screen. 
And for you who are here today, the letter A represents people who already believe. Like, Pastor, I believe. I have a real relationship with Christ. I already had that before I came today. I came celebrating what Christ has done in my life. Many of you would check the box A. Would you do that right now? And then some of you would say, you know what, today, this is the day I'm, I'm ready to believe. Maybe you, you've been around church or you went to church or you have some religion, but you don't know God. In just a moment, I'm gonna lead a prayer to help people who want to believe today. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer that I can't pray for you, but I'll give you the words to say, you can pray that prayer for yourself. And my deep belief is that in that prayer, God will reveal himself to you like never before. So some of you might wanna check B today. And then there's some of you who would say, well, you know what, I'm close. I'm not quite there. I just like to consider it a little bit more. And I wanna tell you that is an awesome place to be. You're welcome to be part of this church. I always dreamed of a church where people could come with their questions and their hangups or whatever it is that, that has you stopped and just come. Just be here, just sit. Just, you don't have to do anything, serve, give, do nothing. Just come and let God speak to your heart for a while. And C is a perfectly acceptable choice. If you wanna just say, I'm close, I just need to consider a little bit longer. And some of you can check C. And then there's the letter D, which is just a real, that's there just for the person who says, you know what, this isn't, I don't ever intend on doing this, it's not for me. And if that's where you are, then check D, it's no problem. I would say, if you don't believe, just give God a chance, keep coming close, like keep coming back, because you never know how one day God may change your thinking. He may open your eyes. So I want to just give you a moment, think about which one you are, give you about 10 seconds, and then I, when you bow your head, I'll know that you're ready for me to pray. All right, let's pray together. Jesus, you are alive, you are risen from the dead. I believe that you are the Lord of all creation, you're the Lord of my life. And I pray that you will come alive in the hearts of your people in a new way. I pray that we won't live like there is no resurrection. I pray that we won't be like a person who has it all and really has nothing but I pray the implications of the resurrection will affect every part of our lives. And I pray for those right now who are ready to believe in you and to trust you. I pray you'd reveal yourself to them in a powerful way now. Now if that's you and you say, I'm ready to believe, I'm gonna give you these words. You pray them sincerely from your heart. If you're here, if you're online, the first part of the prayer is where you just acknowledge that you need God. So say something like, God, I need you. As sincere as you can, God, I need you. I can't live without you. And then the second part of the prayer is to say, I'm sorry. God, please forgive me. I've been wrong to live without you. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. Forgive me. And the last part of the prayer is just tell God that you're ready. God, I'm ready to live for you. I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready to believe that you died and you rose again. I'm ready to let you take charge of my life. Just tell them things like this. God, I'm ready. You might say it this way. God, I give you my whole life. Lord, for every person praying this prayer, I pray that they would sense your presence. I pray that you'd fill them with your spirit like you promised. And Lord, I pray that as you redeem and restore over time, over these next few weeks and months, I pray they look back and not even recognize themselves. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Keep coming back.